My name is Terry Rich. I'm an ornithologist and a birder, and I've been doing this pretty much my whole life. We started this program here, as I said, about four, well, four years, so we're at the end of our fourth year of this. And every month I try to do something a little different, uh, t depending on the season, talking about where our birds are. These, these spring ones, <clears throat> we talk about what birds are right here in Hull's Gulch, and especially focus on song. We do you know, a lot of bird detections by song, this Buick's Wren that I heard yesterday, I heard it singing for probably 15 minutes before I even got a glimpse of it. So I was chasing it through the woods, which is one thing we do when you start going, ah, that song I don't know, what is that bird? And then you start off on your adventure. So song is important, really important. Uh, what else? We usually talk, I talk, we exchange ideas and share observations and we always learn from each other. I always learn something from your experiences. The, the Bird, the world of birds and the world of nature is enormous and enormously complex, and everybody has things they've learned and experienced that other people haven't, so it's cool to share that stuff. I really, I really enjoy that part of getting together. Uh, by about 9 o'clock or so, then we'll go outside and bird. <clears throat> You're welcome to go with us as long as you want, or not at all if you want to go home. And as I always say, you can go home right now if you're already tired of hearing me talk. <laughs> I won't feel bad. We're all adults. So do what you, what you like. But this is a really good time of year. Of course, a lot of birds are breeding. There's still a lot of song. And we usually walk down to the Grove uh, Trailhead parking lot and maybe even below that where the... Uh, maybe I haven't found a catbird yet this year, so maybe there's a catbird hiding out down there. Gnat catchers that way. So that's a good one. That's not a, a real common bird around here for sure. Uh, we, if you don't have binoculars, we have binoculars to borrow. They're here somewhere. I'll have Rebecca get them out, and we have field guides to borrow, and you're welcome to use those. Just bring them back uh, when, we're, when we're finished or when you're finished. Just come back and drop them off. Um, that's maybe enough intro. Yes? Is there still an unusual owl singing on here? I read about oh, I there's been a barred owl, I, I guess. I haven't actually seen it. Anybody know if it's still here? <clears throat> Yeah, there were people, I was running into people looking for the barred owl, and I unfortunately didn't know where it was. It's an eastern owl, but it's been spreading, the species has been spreading in the west for some time now, and causing real trouble with spotted owls out in, in the Pacific Northwest. So we've got our great horned owls. Um, they're around here somewhere. They're kind of dispersing now that the young are quite large. Um, I saw one adult hiding in a cave over here yesterday, but I didn't see anything this morning, first thing. But our, those great horned owls are usually round. We usually pick them up. Um, all right, well, let's get going so we can get out of here and get outside. Um, first, my little story. I put up a nest box in my backyard when I moved to Boise in 1992. It was a nest box suitable for a western screech owl, a flicker, a kestrel, although it's not high enough probably to get a kestrel. Well, this year, that's 1992, this year for the first time ever, we got Western Screech Owls. And I, it, I was extraordinarily lucky uh, a month or six weeks ago, I was out in the yard, it was almost dark, and I actually saw them copulate. It was the, the female's on a branch, she's calling, the male comes in, and of course it's like about a one second encounter or maybe two at the most and bang they're gone and that's that and it's like wow I was looking at the bird when that happened that was extraordinary luck extraordinary luck um, anyway so the, we've been tracking the birds and one of the interesting things is my wife who doesn't care anything at all about birds has become fanatic owl watcher <laughs> it's blowing my mind but of course I'm very happy about it so we watch these guys <clears throat> um, as they started peeking out of the nest, and then as they started sticking their heads out of the nest, and there's, there's three nestlings, which is a little below average, maybe five. So we're not sure why only three. Um, then we went camping, and they fledged while we were gone. So we came back, and it's like, where are the owls looking out of the nest box? And they're like, oh, and we look around for a while. We have a gigantic cottonwood tree. That's what this is in. And then we found these three guys, and they're still there now, uh, hanging around in our cottonwood tree. So there's two of them. There's the two are always next to each other, and then the third one is always a little bit away. So um, yeah, I guess that's probably the third one, right? Where's my pointer? Right there. So that's kind of typical, two, and then kind of one a little bit off. So uh, like I said, my wife's been having great fun with this. Our deck, 
This is three days ago. Our deck looks way worse now because they, they perch right over the deck all night long. I got my wife for her birthday a trail cam. And when she opened it, nobody at the birthday party knew what it was. <laughs> showing that nobody in my immediate sphere is a birder or a biologist or anything else. Like, what's that? <clears throat> so this trail cam is very cool. We're getting it figured out. Uh, it's an IR and it takes pictures. Uh, it's, it's um, triggered by motion, and as soon as something crosses the beam, it takes a picture. So you get things like this. So here's one owl, here's an owl, here's an owl. We're still fooling with it because we really want to get pictures of the birds, the adults flying in with prey. So we're fooling with the setting, but that burn, if you just turn the video on and go to bed, <laughs> it burns a lot, of, a lot of battery and a lot of <clears throat> storage space. So we're trying to get all that figured out. <clears throat> Yeah, that's that's the other camera I got her for her birthday that no one knew what it was. So we've got so we've got one of the Nest Box cams. Now the video will be a live video feed. Of course, I'll put it in sometime this fall probably, and hope we'll get these birds coming back because so far they've been successful. With a little luck, she'll go. Hey, this is a great place to nest and come and do it again. And then we'll have a live video stream to our computer and maybe to the internet. People love to watch that kind of stuff. Do you know how to hook those up, Tom? You ever done one? Yeah, I, I haven't done it, so we're, we're kind of exploring uh, these new cameras and, and video cameras and how they work, but I'm looking forward to it. Got, got, uh, I got this motion camera at Dix. They had, uh, a lot, they had several Moultrie brands, which seem to be highly rated, and then I got the, the web video cam at uh, Wild Birds Unlimited. Julie had one, and when I walked into the store to ask her about it, the camera was sitting there on the counter. It's like, did you know I was coming with this camera? <laughs> No, that's just where I keep it. She only had one, but she can get more. They're 100, 125 bucks, so not exactly cheap, but I think it'll be well worth the entertainment value. Anyway, so on to bird finding. So uh, one thing I always kind of walk, some of you have seen this before, but uh, humans are very, uh, so we have tunnel vision in lots of ways, <laughs> but uh, literally we tend to be very uh, focused. You can see here our normal uh, area where we see or look is, is a very narrow channel out in front of us, but in fact our eyes are perfectly capable of detecting motion way out in here. And the more you bird and the more you start uh, trying to find things, the more you start using this peripheral vision. You'll see things, you know, just fly over the edge in the sky or make a, a little jet through the woods over here on your right and you go, wow, what's that? And I, I notice it, it's really obvious when you go out with people who are not birders, <laughs> stuff flies by, like a hawk will go by and they don't see it and you're like, whoa, <laughs> think about killed me, you know. So, so you, you sort of sensitize your uh, ability to see and detect birds visually. Um, listening, it's kind of the same thing with listening. Uh, you know, you, uh, the more you bird, the more you start just kind of listening for every sound that's out there and you might, do you guys need chairs? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the more you start uh, picking up maybe distant sounds, you can't even tell what they are, dogs barking. People's voices come in all kinds of frequencies and sounds. You, you hear that, so that, is that a person over the hill or is that a chat over the hill? So again, you sort of enlarge your, your field of detection. And for me, one of the things that's hardest, and I had my grandkids out birding, camping a couple, over the weekend, you know, you can't get kids to stop or slow down, and it's even hard to get adults to slow down until you start birding and you realize that you can, and very often we'll go out here and stand out here for 10 minutes, or even longer depending on what's around. You don't have to go somewhere uh, to bird. You, you wait for the birds, and if there's no birds, then you move, and as soon as you get birds, you stop. And, and see, kind of see and hear everything you can, and then you move again. So if hiking is great, but birding and hiking are not always super compatible. Uh, if people fairly often come to me and say, I saw this bird, and then I first thing I say, well, how big was it? And these are three really good basic. Everybody, I think, knows what a robin, a sparrow, and a crow looks like. You know, get it into the size range. Then you, you really narrow it down. Uh, it's helpful if you know some of the terms for the parts of the bird, um, and there are lots of different. This is just some of the most basic. There are many, many other descriptors for parts of a bird. Uh, but it, things like eye line, uh, wing bars, does it have some kind of crown? Is the breast plain or streaked? 
Does it have a crest? Uh, if the wing is open, does it have, can you see some sort of white in the wing or maybe some red or black or something else? So uh, another thing, uh, and this is probably the hard, you can't really teach this, this is the hardest thing, but it's this, people who, who bird a lot get very good at, a bird flies over and, and they know what it is, and somebody says, how'd you know it was that? And you go, well, because it was, it just was. <laughs> uh, and, it's, and I like this illustration because it's the way you can tell uh, a son or a daughter or a, a parent or a friend even if they're at some distance by, the way, by their posture, their shape, the way they walk, certainly if they make a sound, their voice, you, you know instantly that it's that person and not some other person. So you can get this for bird species as well. And one of the first field guides Roger Torrey Peterson did back in the what, early 50s or late 40s, right in the opening, uh, the frontispiece or the whatever you call it, when you open the book, are all these silhouettes of birds. So obviously he was all over it. And then you can see things like, <clears throat> here's a mockingbird, whether the tail is up or the tail is down, that have a fairly short tail. Is it on the ground? Is it on the trunk? Uh, short tail, long tail, another crest, kind of a fat tail. Uh, so the proportions, a little quail here with a little short tail and a fat body. So the proportions and the shapes of these birds, dove, kingfisher, grackle, uh, swallows, um, is again things you pick up over time and, and uh, they can't, I don't think you can really learn that like overnight. You can study this stuff a lot but a lot of it's just experience. So um, again I repeated this from last month but we're going to talk about song in a few minutes so I want to kind of go through this again. Uh, typically we have males singing a lot more than females. Um, earlier in the season they're trying to attract a mate and also tell other males hey uh, this is my spot uh, don't come over here. And they usually don't fight about it. They just space themselves out and go, okay, you be there, I'll be here. So it's a very civilized sort of a thing most of the time. There is some fighting out there. You've probably seen it. And they're just saying, hey, I'm here. This is my space. There are vocal learners and non-learners. Um, most of the songbirds that we see and hear around here are learn their songs. Uh, some that don't are like morning doves and kingfishers and woodpeckers. But the things that learn their songs, like this lazuli bunting right here, uh, tend to have a lot more variation because they can learn, they can improvise, they can recombine notes they learned or they've heard from other birds. And then you get uh, into things that mimic like catbirds and mockingbirds and even chats, starlings. And they actually you know, pick up the songs and calls of other species. So their songs can become enormously complex. Um, and yet still there's a quality about these bird songs that give, usually give them away like that. I don't care what notes the lazuli bunting is singing, as soon as he starts singing I know what it is by the quality of the notes. And we'll talk about quality issues uh, or quality descriptors here in a second. Um, Non-learners then are very uh, stereotypical. Um, our says Phoebes out here, which I, I just learned that their nest accidentally was destroyed. So hopefully they'll have time to re-nest, but they have a little simple call and they just do it over and over and over and over again. There's no improvisation. They all sound the same. Says Phoebe here and a Says Phoebe in Reno. You know in a second that it's a Says Phoebe. So they're not learning anything that's innate. Woodpeckers, as I said, kingfishers, uh, a lot of others um, have innate calls. Species differ from each other, thankfully, and that's how we can go out and uh, again, once you get used to this, you can tell what species is, is what pretty quickly in most cases. Uh, among these learner song learners, individuals also differ from each other. And, and this is a little harder to pick up, but if you walk out, I spend a lot of time in the sagebrush country. If you walk out and listen to uh, like a sagebrush sparrow, one of my favorite birds, or a brewer sparrow, certainly it's very easy to tell them apart. You can tell that one is singing that song, that one's song is a little different, that one's a little different, and you can actually keep track of the individuals uh, and, and tell them apart. Now, that, that isn't to say their song never changes, but at least over a short period of time, they will do something that, so you can tell the individuals apart. And then, kind of the, one of the cool things that happens is song matching, and sagebrush sparrows uh, do this. A lot of territorial birds You'll hear, you'll hear one bird singing a song and another bird singing a slightly different song, and after a couple of rounds, they're singing the same song, so they match each other. So a lot of these um, territorial males that are singing will, will and can match, and when that's taken to sort of an extreme and becomes sort of part of their DNA, literally, 
you get what are called dialects. And the, the best example around, well, not around here exactly, but the white, uh, white crowned sparrows along the Pacific coast from Alaska down into Baja have dialects. So if you listen to bird, birds in San Francisco Bay and then go down to whatever the next bay is, I don't know what that is, they may all be singing a slightly different song, but all the same, more or less the same. And then on down the coast to get San Diego and so on. So you get these dialects that are much like human dialects where you can tell somebody usually who's moved up from Georgia to Boise, you can usually pick them out pretty fast, I think. So the, the uh, terms used to describe songs um, have been sort of uh, unregulated, unstandardized until Nathan Peeplo came out with a book about a year ago and I'll, I'll go into his terminology where he's trying to standardize these phrases. And these are the terms I've used over time. Again, if a person comes to me and says, I heard this bird, didn't see it, I heard this bird, the first thing I want to know was it, uh, actually I should have these together, was it a whistled song or a buzzy song? So is it like, and we'll listen to all examples of all these, is it a, is it a whistly, you know, something I can do with my mouth, or is it a buzzy song that I, I can't begin to do really very well, and we'll, we'll listen to examples. So how, and then there's something I call twitters, like western kingbirds, we'll listen to these. A lot of pippy notes, jumping around, very hard to describe otherwise. Is it a trill? And thankfully, Nathan picks up trill as one of his proposed standardized. And again, we'll listen to these. Um, is, it a simple, is it a simple song or a complex song? Uh, is it melodic? That's a phrase I use. I think to my ears, um, you know, some songs like, uh, oh, what's a really good example? Well, uh, Black Headed Girl Speak or uh, uh, Lazuli Bunting. Song Sparrow even are melodic, they have very musical sounds. And then you have some that are, uh, where are we melodic? You have some like chipping sparrows and bank swallows that are just kind of noisy buzzes or noisy chips. Then there's not really any music to it. Of course, the speed, and Nathan go, uses speed as, as his one, one of his two big splits. Is it fast or slow? So like that. Is there repetition? Does it go up the scale or down the scale? And we'll look at a slide about that too. And then, of course, mimics. Who uh, you go? I'm looking at a. I'm looking at a starling, but it's doing a killdeer. So that sort of thing. And of course, that's fairly rare. So again, Nathan's book, uh, uh, Field Guide to the Bird Sounds of Eastern North America, and his website is called <laughs> Earbirding. Uh, he gave a, uh, a four-hour symposium or a four-hour workshop, really. Excuse me, at a. Burning Festival I attended last fall. Did anybody see him when he was here at Hagerman? So you heard Nathan talk. Did you go on a field trip with him as well? Yeah, cool. So that was really great that Hagerman was able to bring uh, Nathan up. A, a tremendous, tremendous amount of work he's put into bird songs. It's, uh, I, it's really an encyclopedia uh, reference. It's not something you'll sit down and read. It's like the Oxford English Dictionary. I mean, if you want to know what a word means, that's where you go, and that's what Nathan's book is like. So he describes, um, again, trying to standardize how we talk about bird songs. Nobody's really done that. Nobody has done that before. So he talks about the seven basic tonal qualities. Let's see if we've got everything working still. Whistles. There's no buzzy quality to it. It's just a whistle. Hooting's pretty obvious, I think. It's not very loud. Um, I don't know if this is turned all the way up or not. Oh well, let's keep going. You know what a hoot sounds like, I think. And again, um, if you're not familiar with spectrograms, this is frequency from low to high, and this is time. So most of these hoots are very low frequency and drawn out. Let's see if I can make that one stop. This is always a video game for me here to do, run these things. Uh, clicking, which is interesting to me, uh, this happens when you have a very broad spectrum from high to low frequency, but it all happens at once. So it sounds to us like a click. If you slow this way, way, way down, you can hear more complexity in there. But uh, it's so fast, I don't know if you need, you probably know what a click sounds like. I think that's a yellow rail. 
If you want to go see a yellow rail, you go out in the marsh in the middle of the night with two little pebbles and tap them together. <laughs> and sometimes they'll actually attack you because you're singing their song and you're in their space. Now that doesn't, you know, and it blows my mind. This works for yellow rails just as well as a song sparrow song works for song sparrows. And think of how much more complex a song sparrow is. So it's really interesting that very different signals work perfectly fine for the species that have evolved with those signals. Okay, here's the other, like I said, for me, I always start with, is it whistled or is it buzzy or burry? So you hear that reedy, buzzy? And again, we'll listen to some more of these. I think it's a black-throated green warbler. We have black-throated grays uh, in some of the juniper zones in our mountains, which are very similar to this. Kind of a, a weak, buzzy song with a few notes. It's actually pretty distinctive. Nasal. So... Right, nuthatch, red-breasted nuthatch. What's interesting about nasal sounds is the, uh, look at the frequencies. They're, it's kind of the same note at all, a bunch of different frequencies at the same time. And he will not stop. Okay, <laughs> noisy. So the concluding part of a yellow-headed blackbird song. So it doesn't really have any shape. It, there's quite a frequency spread, and it lasts over some time. There's no shape to it. It's just noise, noisy. Um, you know, obviously there aren't that many nasal and noisy songs out there. And then polyphonic. Sing again? Where are you? And that is a, sorry, Montezuma oropendula from the tropics. <laughs> Did you know it? You recognize it? Yeah, there's no bird on the planet that sounds like that. Um, <clears throat> it's a, but the point is, it's a, it almost sounds like there's four or five things being done at once and they're on different scale pitches, and you really wonder how they do that with their, their vocal capacity. Okay, polyphonic. So the four basic song patterns that Nathan talks about are here. And I, I think this is a pretty good uh, split. So we've got uh, notes that are slow enough to count, and each note is different. And he calls that a phrase. And I'm putting these up here because I'm trying to get them in my brain as well, instead of my Twitter and melodic and all the terms I've used. Uh, if the notes are slow enough to count, and they're, but they're all the same, he calls it a series. If the notes are too fast to count, and they're all different, and uh, you'll, I think we'll find that a lot of our birds are in this category. A warble, and if they're too fast to count, but all the same, a trill. So you'll break all bird songs into these four categories. And as we listen to some of these then, so I put it over here, we can sort of think, try to think, well, would I call it this, 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 or this? Okay, and let's listen to examples. Uh, okay. Unique, but slow enough to count. See if you can count them. One, two, three. Two, three, four. All right, so an, a robin. Also whistled, by the way. Okay, slow enough to count all the same. Almost too fast to count, but you can probably count those if you had to. That's a rock run, by the way. All right, now we're getting into too fast and variable. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> that's a house finch. So that's a good one to practice on. A lot of house finches around. 
Um, and then too fast to count, but all the notes are the same. What do you hear what I do? Yeah, I can't do it. Chipping Sparrow. So then as we, again, as we look at these others, uh, songs, listen to them, we'll see. And then uh, patterns, you know, does it go on this? And this is helpful. Uh, last month, we were, somebody was talking about a thrush they heard. And I said, does it go up, down, or all the same? She said, um, it was always going up. So that made it a Swainson's thrush. Hermit thrushes do all three of these. All right, so what I thought we'd do, um, I've got birds that, are, that we could, and pro well, very good likelihood of seeing this morning if we go out and bird for an hour, hour and a half in Hull's Gulch. And so I've got three birds here, and then I've got three bird songs, and we'll just play a little quiz on matching here and see uh, what we know. So again, these are all flycatchers. Their songs are inherited, so they all do the same thing. And all of these, if you see this bird, or this bird, or this bird here, or again in Reno, or in Salt Lake City, it's gonna sound the same. So that's very handy for us when we're trying to learn these birds. So what do you think about this? What is this bird? You're gonna play elimination mode? All right. Call that twittery. What's that? I know there's no Twitter. <laughs> I would call it twittery. I, feel, I still think that's a good word. I've talked to Nathan about that. All right. This is the wood peewee, the western wood peewee. They've got this very uh, burry, repeated song. Buzzy, burry, up and down, up and down. Always the same. Pardon? It doesn't fit. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. Um, what do you think? I mean, it's basically got a single call that it just repeats over and over again. So it's not really any of these. It's uh, it would be a, series. a series, I suppose, because the notes, they're very slow, right? But in the sense that every time he does that, that's, an, that's another song. So it's not like a song where it goes, re, 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 re. so we can quibble about, uh, yeah, but really, I suppose that's the only one that's even close, right? So Western Wood Pee Wee, we should hear those. That's Sage Phoebe, the guy who was nested out here and had his nest, her nest, inadvertently destroyed. Uh, Rebecca said they put the nest, the eggs all broke. It was on this light box out here where she often nests, and they had to repair the light box because it's an emergency light, so they could not have it working. The, um, the eggs all broke. They put the nest back up, and she knocked the nest off the nest box repeatedly. So... I don't know if that's anger issues or <laughs> what, but I felt very bad. Hopefully, they'll still re-nest somewhere around here. So repeated, uh, very, I mean, similar to the Western Wood Pee in that sense, right? Just a kind of a short little song over and over and over again, as long as it lives the same. And it's really clear. It's not at all buzzy. It's not buzzy. Yeah. And so that's... Yeah. You use some of these characters. So... Yeah, it has a buzzy quality, whereas this is more of a whistle. Yeah, That's a good exactly. point. So you can still use these terms, even if they And then, of course, the last bird, Western Kingbird, which I call Twittery. I still think it's the best description. Whoops. <clears throat> oh, I went to the next slide. 
That's one. Gave away my first bird. They always sound like really agitated. <laughs> All right. So here's three more species in the gulch that do not learn their songs, and their songs are somewhat similar. I've grouped them by similar, even though these are very different taxonomically. These first three were all flycatchers. Right, northern flicker. Right, American kestrel. <coughs> Loud. Repeated, I guess it's clearly a series. You could count those, you could count both of those. <clears throat> and then, of course, that leaves our last guy. Too fast to count. And repeated. Yeah, so we oddly call that a trill, which <laughs> I don't think of. Um, belted kingfishers as having a trill, but under this taxonomy, that's where, it would, that's where it would fall. Okay, now let's get into some complex songs that are in the gulch here singing. So, clearly too fast to count, clearly not repeated notes, or at least I think it's clear. That's correct, it's a house wren and it's, uh, I think, clearly a warble. You could almost count those, but probably not quite. Songs are different. I would call it fast, I'd call it another warble, and that is, which is that? Song Sparrow. Song Sparrow, right? Starting out with those two to five ding, ding, ding notes. Very, very distinctive, I think. And then, uh, of course, that leaves our last guy. So, probably have another warble. The descriptor I like for this, to me, is musical or ringing or bell-like, I don't know, some of those kind of qualities, because you get this kind of ding, ding, ding. And a lot of times these uh, buntings repeat their notes, so kind of go two, 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 if you listen closely. A little, a raspberry note in the bunting? Huh, interesting. That's a good clue right there. I've never used that. What I, f I find, uh, yeah, once in a while the buntings and uh, maybe a little tiny bit of a, ho a house wren song, if it's a house wren doesn't sing its whole song, just a couple notes, sometimes I can't quite tell if it's a bunting or a house wren. Okay, so here's a bird that learns its song, although you wouldn't know it. It seems like all they do are two or three different things, and then two that don't, two woodpeckers with loud notes. Well, not that loud, I guess. <laughs> so what's that? Little peaks, yep, downy woodpecker, little peak notes, peak, 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 peak. Of course, this is only, as I said, only one of the songs that, or one of the vocals that the, this bird does. So what is that one? Red winged blackbird, right? And then... So I think these are all down slurred single notes. Don't really fall into song categories. More like call, just calls. All right. Some of my very favorite birds in the whole world are right here. And these guys all have, are all song learners. Um, 
at least this catbird mimics, I think the chat probably mimics some, but he's got enough of variety in his own songs he doesn't really need to mimic. And this, this guy does some kind of goofy stuff, so let's listen to these. Note that this song kind of goes on and on. It's pretty typical of the whole family. Phrase, you can count those, they're all different. Although they, some of the things are repeated eventually. Anybody know what that one is for sure? All right, we'll keep going then. <laughs> it's not the Oriole. Both Orioles and Chats have that chatter. You gotta wait for them to do something else. At least I do. All right, so that's the Oriole. Now let's listen to the chat, which also, let's see, better stop him. Oh, I guess I gave away what the first one was, didn't I? <laughs> it's a really typical chat note. That one right there. There's its chatter. Oh my goodness, go away, go away, go away. Okay, so both the yellow breasted chat and the Oriole have that chatter. But that note right there is, you, you almost always hear out of the chat before very long, these, these hoots, little hooty, musical hooty notes. All right, let's go back to the cat bird. So a lot of variety, but he just kind of goes on and on and on. If you listen to a sage thrasher or a mockingbird, any of the Mimidae family, the mimic thrushes family, they do that. They tend to just go on and on and on and on and on and on. Um, sometimes you can't, with sage thrashers, they, they will sing for literally for minutes on end without taking a break. So they're somehow inhaling and singing at the same time. <clears throat> All right, so the catbird, which I have not heard this year down here, maybe we'll get him this morning. Um, Again, the Oriole starts out with the Oriole and the chat both have this chatter. So that chatter right there. Uh, three more songbirds, a thrush, a finch, and a tanager. They all have generally similar songs. Phrase, slow enough to count. Come on. Buzzy, slow enough to count. Not buzzy, slow enough to count. Those are pretty similar, eh? <laughs> so anybody want to bet their life on that one? See ya. Those are really close songs. That's a gross speak, that's a robin. And then the buzzy one is the western tanager. So they all have these phrases of up and down, whistled notes, tanagers are buzzy. These are faster and sweeter typically, sweeter. Again, that's a term that I, that's my term. Uh, the, the notes are kind of thinner and higher compared to robin, a little lower, a little slower. 
but sometimes you have to, even when you're walking down here, you gotta go. Let me listen to that again, please. <laughs> all right, so I brought him back because I wanna compare, these birds all have buzzy qualities in their songs. Sorry, that isn't louder where that speaker is. So we already listened to that. that let's, uh, so obviously that's the tanager. Uh, so let's focus on these two vireos. Can you count that? I can't. So that's a warbling vireo, very fast. Still up and down. So we're over, I guess, into warble again because we've got uh, notes that are too fast and they're not repeated. But they have a buzzy quality. And this bird that I just heard camping this weekend up in the pine forest at Pine Flats near Loman, really slow, buzzy song. I love it. Very similar to the western tanager, and they're right together up in the ponderosa pine breeding right now. But this guy is almost always slower, quite slow, lazy sounding. All right, just a few more minutes. Um, so we've got some warblers around. Hulls Gulch is loaded with yellow warblers. Um, yellow rumps, are there probably still a few hanging around, but they're mostly also now up where they're gonna breed in the ponderosa dug for a zone. And then these common yellow throats that are typically in marshes, cattails, and that sort of thing. So that's a yellow rumped warbler. It's almost always two parts with the second phrase slow enough to count. The second phrase being a little higher. You know, that, that last bit goes up. That's typically the case. Tweet, 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 tweet. The red-winged blackbird should give that one away. <laughs> So one of the most distinctive warblers we've got, yellow common yellow throat, wheat do wheat do wheat do wheat do out in the marsh. Can't miss it. And if you can see it, you can't miss it either. Very distinctive bird. I have not heard one of, the, one of these around here in the last week or two. And then the most common one in the gulch is by far, I think I had 15 yesterday. Is that it? So, no, I was just going to say, you know, this guy kind of always goes down and then up a little bit on the two phrases. And these guys, it seems like they move around. So that goes up and then back down again. So uh, that's a little tougher one to, to figure out. Okay, almost at nine o'clock, time to go actually listen to these guys in the real world. So some, uh, we already listened to him, we'll see if we can remember that. Birds that have very fast and complex songs. Paired notes with a ringing quality. That's the way I think about it. Sorry, Nathan. Uh, lazuli bunting. Rambling, 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 rambling. Well, it started out to be a, there we go. And a lot of, you're talking about the raspberries. To me, the house benches often at the end have, do have a raspberry note, actually. Yeah. You can hear it in this one. They ramble, 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 and at the end it goes yeah. Mm -hmm. 
hear that? This one's doing it really well. So if you get Cassin's finches and house finches together like you can like up around Silver City, you can have both. And I have to usually wait and listen to it a few times and see if it ever I ever, I ever hear that G at the end of the song. And if not, and I can't see the bird, it's more likely to be a Cassin's. They're a little bit more musical, but to me those two songs are really similar. Okay, so that leaves American Goldfinch. You know, and I don't know how you describe that. It's fast, it's complex. You get that little note, which is kind of a goldfinch thing and nobody else does. Twee. A little querulous. That used to be called Twitter, but can't use that. Can't use Twitter anymore. <laughs> Twitter got ruined somehow, but we won't go there. Let's see, okay, we got a minute for a few more. So a couple of birds we'll hear, not today, but uh, if you come back on July 11th, not July 4th, July 11th, and we'll go up to Bogus, we should hear both of these. And this is where the idea of going up the scale or down the scale or, or across, I don't know what you need to call that, across the scale. Um, becomes really helpful. Where are you? See from that opening note, it might go down, up, or across on the frequency. And it starts at different pitches. That's kind of a good clue too. And these are right with exactly with each other. It's very interesting. So Swainson's thrush goes up the scale almost every single time. Mm -hmm. But they still have that wonderful thrush, that rich musical thrush quality that's just so amazing. Would that be considered or I think so, yeah. Yeah, good, good point. Good point. These are both polyphonic because there's... They can actually make sounds on the, both sides of their voice box, so they, can, they are actually doing at least two things, well, two things at once, and it sometimes sounds like more than that. So good point, Kathy Polyphonic. And then of course, if you see them, you gotta work on it a little bit to tell which one it is. This has a little bit of a reddish brown tail, and these guys are, or wait, I'm sorry, this guy has a reddish brown tail. That looks reddish brown from here. If I got the wrong picture in there. Um, and then these guys, Swainsons, are pretty uniformly. The back and the tail look the same. On these guys, they tend to be a little contrast and they're red, a little redder. Uh, whoops, wrong way. Um, I don't know how many more I've got. Let's do these flycatchers and then I'll do some quick news and we'll get out of here. So, all these little Impidnax flycatchers, I had a beautiful Cordilleran flycatcher down at the Grove yesterday. Totally, well, no impedinacs are totally different, I guess, from each other, but the, the Cordilleran, which I haven't put up here, is a, is a rich brown, almost yellow underneath. It's got a big old teardrop-shaped eye ring. But these little guys all just look gray and little, and they have wing bars, and it's like, ah, oh, whatever. But their songs are definitely different, and you just sometimes pray that they sing. So these guys are now up in the, mostly up in the Doug Fur Zone, up with the Tanagers and the Cassins Virios and the Yellow Rump Warblers, they're up there. And they sit and just do these little tweet, twit, tweet, twit, twit, tweet, twit, twit, tweet. If you happen to get lucky and get a willow, It's described as Fitzbew, and it's, it usually sounds louder than this. Fitzbew. Very different from this. And then grays, which are out in the sagebrush, especially in taller sagebrush. To me, it just sounds like splat. <laughs> I think splat, splat. So it's explosive. It's, it's not a twittery or any song like this at all. It's more like this and that's uh, explosive, but there's no Fitzbue to it. It's just bleh, bleh, bleh. They also have a longer tail. Good luck with that. Um, Terry, so, is there any relationship between the size of the whoop, bird and the there volume? It is. Size of the bird and the volume. 
probably in general, but do you ever hear a ruby crown kinglet? <laughs> Holy cow, <laughs> you know. And even a house wren. I mean, look how small they are and how pretty loud the song is. So I think in general, it, there probably is bigger birds that make louder sounds. I mean, think of a, a raven, you can hear it maybe a mile away, or even a crow. Magpies, you can hear forever. Uh, these little warblers, you know, you're not going to hear them very far away. But singing very softly. They totally can control their volume. I don't remember too much about it. There's a, a, actually a type of song called a whisper song. And I don't remember any more of the conditions. But just what Kathy's saying, it'll, it'll be the same song they always sing, but they're just not putting any punch behind it. And I think you can hear it really well, like in metal arcs. Sometimes they just belt. And sometimes they kind of hold back a little bit. So uh, a lot of variation. I would say generally true, but a lot of variation. And yeah, and so you get, but you get a little, especially like warblers, they can't really punch out a song. So that's always kind of weak. It's not going to carry very far. Yeah. Remember our adult owl, how he, she seemed to act like a bellows just to make that little whinny sound, like her whole body just went, you know. Just to make that little, that little whinny, yeah. Like it took a lot of effort to get that sound. Well, and you watch, I mean, I put a video of a house wren that I got very close to up on Tom's uh, Facebook page yesterday, a uh, house wren singing. I mean, their whole being shakes <laughs> when they sing, and they just do it over and over and over and again. It's like, oh my gosh, I get tired watching you. So yeah, they put a lot of energy into singing. Well, I already gave away my mystery bird here. So uh, if you're running around in the riparian areas, we're really trying to find all the yellow-billed cuckoos in Idaho. They're very, very few, so if you hear that. Okay, uh, well, I guess we won't have time for this, but let me point out Birdsong Hero. This is really fun. I went through last night, and I still didn't get them all right. It makes me furious. They, they, uh, every time you go back, they randomize what they present you. So what they basically do uh, is show you a sonogram, three sonograms and three species of birds, and then they give, have a mystery song, and they play it, and you need to match the sonogram and the song to the species. So go check it out. It's really a fun place to, uh, like I said, I didn't even get them all last night. Uh, I was like, ah. Uh, there's two levels, beginner and then advanced. Um, and it, it's, it's a good place to tune your eye and your ear if you want to just kind of mess around. All right, so uh, for all of you who have not participated or visited Idaho Birding Facebook page, Tom Carroll. Tom, you want to raise your hand? Tom is the keeper. This is just a great place where people are posting um, bird photos and some videos and sometimes it's a query, what is this? And it's a great place to go see tremendous photography of our birds and also maybe help out people identify things. People are just getting started uh, and they don't know what it is and you put it up there. Even And what's fun is when people put up a really horrible photograph of something, that, I like those actually, like what's this? And then you kind of, everybody Kind of, and that's what brings Jay Carlisle and Heidi Ware out of the woods. The real experts are going, ah, let's see. Let's see if we can figure this one out. It's a really fun place. I highly recommend it. Um, and I also want to point out a Golden Eagle Audubon Society. Go to their website right here under events. If you click on that, you will get a calendar. And here's Kathy's, maybe you can't quite read it, but it'll show you by date, by time, what's going on around the valley for birding. If you want to go birding, you want to see programs in the inside in the evening. And uh, if you click on each one of those, then you get yet more detail of exactly what and where is going on. So we try to, I think, Golden Eagle tries pretty hard to get all the bird-related stuff in there. So that's kind of one-stop uh, shopping. I should see if I'm in there. Wednesday morning club. Don't look. Don't look? <laughs> You're there. <laughs> So, like I said, the first Wednesday is here, and all the other Wednesdays we meet at Jean Jou. Um, if you click on the name of the, the trip, whether it's Wednesday morning club, Bluebird Trail, whatever. Bluebird Trail. Yeah. So on the Wednesday morning club, it'll give you a list. It'll expand out and say, okay, this is where we're going, this is when we're meeting. So, lots of birding to be done around the valley. Oh, I'm always plugging eBird. I don't know why they don't give me a penny. 
Uh, I love the eBird, put all my data in there. But I just want to point out, this month, June's challenge, and if you are lucky to win this, you get a $2,400 pair of binoculars. They give one away every month. This month, you have to submit 15 checklists with breeding behavior codes. So for each bird, at least one bird in your checklist, you need to go in there and say, what is the highest possible code? Did you have nest with young, nest with eggs, feeding young, carrying food? Was a bird building a nest? Uh, was a bird agitated? <laughs> um, visiting a probable nest site. I had a flicker and a hole down here, so that would be visiting a probable nest site. Courtship display. I had a kestrel bombing a red tail yesterday, so that means a kestrel probably is breeding and wants the red tail to get out of here. So that's that one. Territorial defense uh, right there. Population, I had my western screech owls uh, population. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of mine I find are singing male. It's a singing male. I don't know if it's paired. I don't know if there's a nest. I don't know if they're egg. I don't know anything else, but there's a singing male. So that category for me, uh, where is it? Happens a lot. And then you have uh, kind of the weakest one, I suppose, in appropriate habitat. So we got all these morning doves around here. I don't, I presume they all have nests. I don't know. Uh, they're not really even singing, they might be, but they're in appropriate habitats, so check that. Anyway, if you do that 15 for 15 checklists, you get a chance to win the best binoculars on the planet.